As I said before, my name is Dan, uh, one of the leaders here at the church. And last week we were in Matthew 11 and I was talking about how John the Baptist is the guy who's named as the greatest ever born of women. Like of all of us, John the Baptist is better. John the Baptist is greater and it was because he gave his life to point to the light that is Jesus. That's what made him so great. He wasn't the light himself, but he spent his whole life uh, pointing towards Jesus. And so finished up last time, if you've got your Bible in, and around verse 15 uh, of chapter 11. So I'm going to do from 16 to 30 today, um, but obviously that's quite a chunk, so I'm not going to cover absolutely everything. I'm going to read it all out uh, word for word um, this morning, but a whole host of it is going to be covered um, as we go through. And it's all about finding rest in Jesus. That's what this passage is about. The first bit is kind of a contrast saying, here's the people that are getting it wrong, And then there's the solution at the end of, well, this is how you can get it right. If you don't want to be like this and you want to find rest, you want peace, you want comfort for your souls, this is what you've got to do. So Jesus kind of lays it out for us. And as I said before, this week, this last week's been pretty heartbreaking, hasn't it? Um, It's been pretty painful to just kind of watch on. It it tells me, uh, it reminds me again, if I needed reminding, that we live in a chaotic world. And that we live in a world that actually we're, we get things wrong, we're a broken people. Um, but within that, we have capacity for good. We have capacity to know Jesus. We have capacity to love, capacity to share peace with one another. And the only answer, the only solution to the chaos, the pain, the sin, the injustice is met in Jesus. And that's what I think is comes across so strongly from this passage this morning, which I think is timely. Um, So, in fact, I am going to read it. I'm just going to read the whole thing. I wasn't planning on doing so, but I think it's good to do that. So it's Matthew 11. Um, I I feel kind of compelled to do that. Matthew 11, 16 through to the end of the chapter. I will be repeating some of this as we go, but I don't know, something nudging me to just read it. What shall I compare this generation? Is it like children sitting in marketplaces and calling to their playmates, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance, we sang a dirge, you did not mourn. For John came neither eating or drinking and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say look at him, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Then Jesus began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they didn't repent. Woe to you, uh, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it would be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum... Will you be exalted to heaven? You'll be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. And obviously Sodom, the famous story in the Old Testament where it was destroyed because of unrighteousness and it was known as a city of sin. It just didn't have a good reputation, that place. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal to him. And here's the solution to all that lack of repentance, for all that brokenness, for all that hurt, for all that chaos. This is what Jesus speaks. Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus offers this amazing, transforming solution that would transform the world over if everybody heeded his words. If everybody went to Jesus, you think the world would be a different place? Because I do. I think it would be a much better place. And uh, I've got a, a bunch of kind of quick fire points, um, well, four of them, um, that I've just kind of drawn from the passage. And so if we want rest, 
if we want rest, how do we go about that? And the first thing that I, we come across, I think, in this passage is that we have to live to please God. Um, Aesop, who's the great kind of Greek storyteller, um, and then they collated a bunch of his works um, and called it Aesop's Fables, for those that know that. Um, one of his famous fables kind of uh, came to my mind, the famous story of the master, his son, and the donkey. And the story is that there's the master and his son, and they're on a dusty path, and they're on a journey. Um, I'm not going to quote it word for word. I'm doing it in Dangawa style. And they're going along the road, and uh, they've got their donkey and nobody's on it. And they come across the first kind of characters coming the other way, and they're like, what are you doing? Old man, you are really tired. Why aren't you on the donkey? So the old man gets on the donkey and starts riding the donkey, and the, the son pulls it along. And then they come across the next bunch of people, and they're like, old man, you are so selfish. Why are you riding the donkey and you're letting your son walk? So the old man gets off and the son gets on the donkey. And they're, they're walking along again. And the third people come in and are like, son, you are so selfish. Your, your, your father is old. Why don't you both ride on the donkey? So the father gets on the donkey and the son's on the donkey as well. And the donkey at this point is probably at it. He's, he's not enjoying himself. And they carry on on their journey. I think that's what the donkey's thinking. And, um, and they're going along and they come up to another people and they're like, oh my goodness, you guys are so cruel to animals. How could you both ride on the donkey? That is just not fair. He's not meant for this. And so they're like, okay, well, we'll get off the donkey. So they both get off the donkey. And the donkey by this point is like panting because obviously the old man and the son has been on the donkey. And so what they do is they go, well, I know. Why don't we carry the donkey? That would, that would help the donkey. So they, I say tie him up, that sounds so wrong. Um, they, put, they carry him in some kind of contraption, you know, one at the front, one at the back, and they're, they're walking along, and they enter the city, and everybody in the city is laughing at them. They're laughing at them, saying, look at these guys, they're carrying the donkey, what are they doing? Donkeys are for riding on. And in the commotion, the fable is that the donkey kind of slips out, at, or like kicks free, and the sun drops it. And the donkey is still wrapped up, in the st wrapped up in it, falls into a river and drowns. So now they've got no donkey. And the whole point of the story is, or the fable is, we cannot live and please everyone. Like they met different people, you know, and the animal rights activists at the end were like, come on, what about the donkey? They didn't care about the man and the son, or you had someone who cared about the son, someone who cared about the man. And as they changed their behavior every single time in this fable, it never pleased everyone. That's the world we live in. That's a perfect description of the world we live in, where if we try and please everyone, actually it never works, does it? Because you please someone, well, it upsets somebody else. And here... We have the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they're like, well, John the Baptist came along and he was a bit weird. He went out into the wild and grew his hair long and did weird things. He's got a demon. They said it just like that, I think. And then they're like, but then Jesus came along and Jesus is eating and he's drinking and he's hanging out with the tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus is like, well, you had to go at John for doing this. And I'm doing the complete opposite, and you're having a go at me as well. What are you doing? What are you talking about? And it's this whole thing is we don't live to please man. We have to please God. If we want rest, I tell you, living to please man is a stressful thing. If all in your mind all the time you're like, oh, what happens if this person thinks this? And what happens if that person thinks that? And if I've got it wrong, and I've got that is stressful, right? Well, I think it's stressful. And your mind's like running at 100 miles an hour. And actually, we, we start to critique and we start to be critical, which is what you have here of the Pharisees, because we want to be better than others and we want to please someone. So we say, oh, have you seen how they're behaving? Because we want to feel better about ourselves and we want to please them. And so instead of building up, we end up destroying. Instead of believing the best and outgracing one another, we tear down. And it's not a restful place for us to be. If it happens to the greatest two on the planet ever, because Jesus was the greatest, and then John is the greatest who isn't any part God, and they couldn't, they couldn't live to please other people, and they weren't there to do that, and they lived to please God, I think that's a good model to follow after, isn't it? If that's what greatness looks like, then that's a good thing to do. You know, if I'm really low, um, someone will say to me, why are you so gloomy? Cheer up. But if I'm really happy, they're like, why are you so happy? It's annoying. Like, I can't win. I've just got to be mediocre all the time. 
Like, and then people would be like, why are you so mediocre? Why are you never smile? Why, why are you never upset? The Pharisees and religious leaders by Jesus here are, are, are called children. They're accused of being wayward kids. Um, so it's not complimentary what Jesus is saying here. It's like, it's like a child who's screaming and they're like, no, daddy, I want it right now. I want my way right now. And that's what they do. If you've got kids, especially young kids, although I'm guessing it happens for teenagers too. In fact, I'm pretty sure it probably continues for the rest of life. Uh, thank you, Dos. Yeah. Your kids aren't, yeah, they're not here though, are they? So you can say that. We'll wipe that bit off so you can get away with it. But it's like um, the other day, um, Evangeline, who's now, how old is she? Uh, five? Five. Um, she had a complete meltdown, and she has meltdowns regularly because she hasn't got a gingerbread man. Or we haven't got the ice lolly in the freezer. And it's not fair that we haven't got the ice lolly in the freezer. Like, she's deserving of ice lollies all the time. And you'll never please everyone. If I run around and my whole life is orientated about pleasing Evangeline, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have an effect on somebody else who's going to be upset in some way, shape, or form. But there's no rest in that. Our purpose and what we're created for is to please God. That means love God relentlessly. That means love the Lord your God with all that you are. That means love your neighbor as yourself. That's what love is. That's what following God looks like. And we have to kind of come to that point if we want rest to realize that actually life isn't about our fame, isn't about our expectations, but it's about God. Because if we, if we start living to please God, I think our language starts to change. I think our attitude starts to change. I think the way that we receive compliments or, you know, criticism changes because we realize it's not about us and we're not the hero and it's okay. But it's about God. And that's important because actually we need to realize that we all constantly fall. And we all constantly fail. And we all constantly get it wrong. But grace calls us to go again. We're sinful people, the Bible tells us, but we have a huge capacity for good and a capacity to please God. But in order to do that, we've got to deal with some stuff. And I think that's why Jesus lays it out as he does, where he says this, denouncing cities, denounces Chorazin, denounces Bethsaida, denounces Capernaum a little later on. And what Jesus is saying here is he's done a bunch of miracles. He's spent a bunch of time with a bunch of people and they haven't got it. They've not gone, okay, Jesus, we're going to follow you. We believe in you. We trust in you. In fact, they've done the opposite. They've seen all the miracles and have gone, but you're hanging out with tax collectors. You're spending your time with sinners. You're not hanging out with us. Jesus, you've got it wrong. And Jesus says, actually, because I've done these things, in your towns, it's going to be more bearable for other places. And he mentions two towns. He mentions Tyre and Sidon that would be better for them than it would be for the cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida. And Tyre and Sidon had a reputation uh, at the time of Jesus for being, well, they were Gentile cities, so they weren't Jewish to start with. But idol worship was massive. Back in the Old Testament, those regions, there was a, a false god called Baal or Baal, depending on how you pronounce it. And they would be known known for that kind of worship. These aren't good cities. These aren't, that's a place to go on holiday. These aren't outstanding travel destinations. This is like us going to Mosul today. You wouldn't want to go there on holiday. There's probably no five-star hotels left. These are diabolical cities, and yet Jesus says it would be better for them. If I'd done miracles there, they would have turned around, they would have repented. And it, it tells us something really important about if we want rest with God, and it's first, we cannot afford to hear the good news of Jesus and do nothing with it. That's what those cities did. They heard the good news of Jesus, and they did nothing with it. They didn't turn around. They didn't repent. They didn't put their faith. They didn't believe in Jesus. And so judgment awaits upon them, and that's the reality of the Bible. And I think in terms of our, our grievance of God, right up there, is that if we sit week in, week out, and we've heard the things about Jesus, and yet we've done nothing with it, that is on shaky ground, my friends. We are on shaky ground. And I don't want any of us to be there. Because Jesus says, hey, actually, if we turn around, if we, he invites us to come to him a little bit later on, we can be rescued. You see, the good news of Jesus that's proclaimed transforms our life. In a world full of troubles and people trying to seek things out, we can find peace. 
Did you know the name Noah means rest slash comfort? So when Jesus here is talking about rest and he's talking about comfort and he's talking about peace and he's talking about come to me all who are weary, it's that it brings back was the name Noah. And what happened with Noah? Well, he took rest, comfort, peace on an ark. When the world was in chaos, when the world was in ruin, where was Noah? Following after God, safe with God because he listened to God and he responded. If he hadn't responded, what would have happened to Noah? It'd have been washed away with everybody else. But he didn't. He listened and he responded. And that's what Jesus calls us to, faith and repentance. If we want rest, we will not find it apart from Christ. Sure, we can have a weekend off and we've got a bank holiday, come on. But we will not find true rest for our souls apart from Jesus. So there's the first two things that I think you see in this passage that We've got to live to please God, and we do that by recognizing we ain't it, but we need to turn around and follow after him. And if you're hearing my voice today, and you've not responded to Jesus, and you've not said, I'm in, please go for it. Please put your trust in Jesus. Don't not do it, because it's a dangerous place to be. And then three, really interesting. So Jesus has just been smashing the people of Capernaum. Imagine if you were in Capernaum, or you were in one of these other cities. You'd be like, oh my goodness, this is what awaits us. This is not a good place to be. And then all of a sudden, he switches and says, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father. Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such is your gracious will. There's so much chaos going on in here and chaos depicted in these cities. Seemingly, I guess you would think not much reason to be thankful. Sometimes when we look at our world, we think, is there much to be thankful for? There seems to be so much misery and pain and suffering and stuff going on. And yet Jesus is thankful here. People are thinking that John and him are of the devil. And he's still thankful to his father. A whole load of people have shunned Jesus, have said no to Jesus, yet Jesus is still thankful. I take massive encouragement from that because I think the moment we, we look at the chaos and we, we look at the stuff going on in the world, it makes our hearts heavy. It hurts. The moment we're thankful and we stop and we turn our gaze to heaven, it changes something. It changes something in our hearts as well as in our minds. We don't look at the chaos, but we look to God. Because often, I don't know about you, but my mind isn't always a perfect place. Sometimes I think things I shouldn't think. Sometimes I go, oh, this only happens to me. And my mind takes me down these paths because I look at the chaos or I look at what's happened. Instead, almost Jesus here is like, I thank you, God. He's kind of trying to turn our attention to say thank you, to stop, to pause, and to put our eyes on heaven. And Jesus does that as he talks to his father, and it's interesting that he does that. He comes with a childlike faith. Often you hear stuff, and you hear, I've heard Bible teaching this before, about how we're to be little children. Well, I'm not sure we are to be little children. I think we're to have a childlike faith. I think we're to grow up, actually. But we're to have a childlike faith. What does a childlike faith look like? Complete trust and dependence. My children are at the stage now where, um, I don't do this as an adult anymore, but you know where like, they have no fear in jumping off stuff? And like, you can have things that are like up here, which is like three times their height, and they won't think twice about it. I'm like, are you mad? You're going to break your ankles, um, which I'm sure they would do if I wasn't there. But the fact that they jump, they jump because daddy's there to catch them. They don't hesitate. They have complete trust and faith that I will catch them. There's a childlike faith, whereas as adults, you know, we do those little tests where you stand like that and you think someone's going to catch behind you. Near enough, every time I've ever seen somebody do that, they always have a little sneaky look before they close their eyes and turn around just to check that the person behind them is going to catch them. Because we don't have that childlike faith anymore. We don't have that complete trust. Part of it's been eroded away and destroyed over time. And yet, my daughter trusts I'm going to catch her when she jumps. There's no analysis. There's no, right, I'm six foot in the air here, and if I jump and I fall, I will break my ankles. What about health and safety? What about risk assessments? 
What about all this? Stuff? She's not doing any of that. She's going, if I jump, my daddy will catch me. Plain and simple. Childlike faith and trust that she'll be secure, she'll be safe. Even more so it's true for God, because actually there are going to be times where I accidentally drop her, because I'm not a very good catch. But there's never a time that God's going to drop us. He's got the safest hands in the universe. Never a time. And the verse is here, verse 27, Jesus is talking about all authority has been given to him. He's trustworthy. He's in control. He's sovereign. He's reliable. He's someone you can go to. In the context of chaos, in the context of people having a go, in the context of rejection, Jesus thanks his father with almost a childlike faith, encourages a childlike faith. And then the verses that precede it say, I'm in control. And we're always responsible for whether we're going to take that, put that trust in God or not, have that faith or not. Every time my daughter jumps off the sofa or jumps off somewhere, she is the only one that's responsible for jumping. She's the only one that can do that. And even if we jump, actually, there's someone else who's in complete control who catches us when we do put our trust in him. And that's the point of the invitation that comes. The famous verses, if you like, the verses that you've probably heard before. That Jesus says, well, you've got this chaotic world and you are, I don't know what's happened to my voice. <coughs> it's gone all husky. Uh, you are burdened. You are heavy laden. You are unhappy, whatever it might be. And Jesus says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Put your faith, put your trust in him and he will not let you down. He hasn't let me down ever and nor will he ever let me down. Because unlike me, he's unshakable. He's dependable. And the question that comes into my mind when I read these verses, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. I don't know about you, I go, even me, Jesus? Even me? Even I'm welcome with all my hang-ups and with all the stuff that goes on in my life. Even I can come to you. Even I can take rest. I don't deserve rest. I don't deserve comfort. I don't deserve peace. But I can find it if I come to you. This morning, if you're shouldering some stuff, if you're carrying sickness, if you're broken, if you've got a load on your mind, if you're anxious, if you worry, if you're sorrowful, if you have remorse, if you have pain, you get the picture, this is your invite from Jesus. I'm fairly sure that covers every single one of us, right? That first stage of realizing that we need God, that we can live to please him, I've pretty much, I think, described all of us in some way, shape, or form. That we all have burdens. That we all have weights that we carry. That we trudge through life. Some of us, it's our work life. Some of it's our home life. Some of it's our relationships. Some of it's just stuff that comes our way. John six thirty seven. All those the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. There's your invite backed up again in another place. Whoever comes to Jesus will never be turned away. Whoever jumps will always be caught. Never be dropped. If we come today in faith and repentance, Jesus will not turn us away, but will be welcomed home. You know, this is so different to what the world offers me. If I'm in a place of burden and, and struggle, they'll throw all sorts of things at me. Some of that might be, chin up, mate. You'll be all right. Sun's still shining. Crack on. You know, sometimes empty platitudes just make it worse. Whereas actually Jesus offers a solution here for all those struggling, all those broken. There's no five pillars to follow. There's no strict law to carry on. There's no bondage to something like other religions and other faith groups. There's simply, come to me and I'll give you rest. That's the simplicity of what Jesus does. Nothing else added, nothing else take away. Just come to me and you will find rest. You know, we have all these books. They're like everywhere now. You know, 10 tips to a successful life or 
10 tips to make yourself happy. Can I give you two tips? One, throw the book away. Two, trust in Jesus. If we want a satisfied life, if we want a fulfilled life, we will find it in Christ, nowhere else. That's what Jesus says. If you're weary, if you're broken, if you're down and out, come to me. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle, I'm lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A yoke, not the thing from, uh, if you've got your Bible open, you'll notice a different spelling. But for those that don't, not like your egg yolk, but a yoke, we don't really kind of come across it today. It's not like you see a couple of oxen kind of parading down the street, is it? Um, But a a yoke would be uh, something that was used with oxen in particular, but not exclusively. And it joined them together that um, ran their necks with like a a bar across. And they'd be able to kind of, I don't know, plow and do their stuff. Uh, But they'd be doing it together. They'd be like a team, if you like. Sharing the burden, sharing the weight. And Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And you know what this picture of kind of being yoked I think kind of conveys a picture of hard work, if you like. It's not like um, they had a yoke and they didn't do anything, but these oxen worked hard. They were heavy laden. They were weighed down. They were under pressure. And Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. He doesn't say, here's a free pass. He says, take my yoke upon you. What it means is life is going to be a battle still. Life is still going to be hard. We are going to have our ups and downs. But having Jesus yoke, taking that upon us means we take God with us into those situations where before we were on our own. What's this work we're to do? Because if we're to take a yoke upon us, take Jesus' yoke upon us, that almost means like we're joined together with him. There's an implication that there's a work on our behalf. John 6, the work of God is this. Here you go, it's going to blow your mind. The work of God. This is what God wants in terms of our work. The work of God is this, to believe in the one who he has sent. That's our work. We want to be yoked with Jesus, to take Jesus' yoke upon us. We believe who he says he is. We follow after him. There's a beautiful picture, actually, of we're yoked together with Jesus, but who's the one who takes the weight? Who's the one who's carrying us? It's him. There's this beautiful picture of... um, Jesus taking all, all the weight and all the, all, the, all the pressure, all the stuff, all the cost on himself. And we get the rest. Because we're kind of taken along with him. That's the picture that's conveyed here. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. It's not a hard thing for us because Jesus takes it for us. And my burden is light. You see, he delivers us and gives us comfort and he gives us rest and he does that through the cross. That's why we sang about the cross because that's the place that we take our burdens, our weight, our insecurity, our upset, our anxiety, all of those things. That's the place we go because that's the place that our weight is taken. That's the place we find freedom because Jesus takes all our sin and all our rubbish and all our shame and all our anxiety and all our stuff upon himself dies so that we are set free. That's what happens. That's why it's a beautiful thing, the cross. This horrible thing, this, this torturous thing, but also this beautiful thing because it brings us life. And there is a cost in us following after God. There is a cost because we have to deny ourselves. We have to say, I'm not the hero, but Jesus is. But it was something that was pointed out to me on Alpha, and I've said it again, and I think I'm going to say this for the rest of my days is, Yes, there's a cost in following Jesus, and life is not always easy, but there is a greater cost in not following him. There is a greater cost in choosing to not follow Jesus. Just read the words of Jesus there that we've already looked at. There is a great cost. 1 Peter 5 kind of sums it up for me. Humble yourselves. That's important. If we're going to be like Jesus, we've got to be gentle. We've got to be lowly. We've got to be humble. We've got to realize we're not it. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Why respond today? Why come to Jesus? Why bother doing it? Because God loves you. Because he loves you. And he doesn't want you carrying around the weight 
of burdens and the weight of people's expectations and all this stuff. You know, I thoroughly believe with all my heart, all this stuff we, we amassed, we were never meant to carry ourselves. We were never purposed to have to deal with it. Because Jesus deals with it for us. If we would only come to him, if we would only take him up on his offer, come to me all who are weary. Who's weary today? Anybody? All right. Who's heavy laden today? You know what your solution is? Jesus. I'm weary today. I'm heavy laden today. You know what the solution is for me? Jesus. To come to him, to take him up on his invitation, to lay my brokenness at the foot of the cross and say, God, I need your rest. God, I need your comfort. And we enter into the rest he brings. I can't describe the rest to you. I can only say that the moment I put my trust in Jesus, my life changed. That maybe for the first time I experienced what true peace is. I remember a few weeks ago, it was just before Easter, and I was chatting to a guy in church who's come to faith since, which is amazing. And I remember sitting on, I don't think you'll mind me saying this, sitting on my sofa and saying to him, you've got to go for it. You've got to put your trust in Jesus. Believe me, it's the best thing you will ever do. Now, I couldn't explain why. I just said, you're going to have to trust me <laughs> that this is the best thing you'll ever do. You know what his testimony is now? It's the best thing I've ever done because I've entered into rest. I've entered into the very thing I was made for, relationship with God. And there is no better time than right now. When Jesus says, come to me, he doesn't mean next week. He means every day. He means right now in this moment, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. Because next week you might be weary and heavy laden. And if you don't come to him, he's not going to take that stuff off of you. He doesn't rip it from you. He's gentle. He's kind. We're to go to him. If you are carrying stuff this morning, if you are heavy laden, if you are weary, if you need rest, and I think that's all of us, I'm going to be completely honest, it's me. I want to plead with you. I want to plead with you because I think Jesus does when he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take it to Jesus. We were never meant to walk alone. Even though we don't all understand it all, take it to Jesus. Bring it to him and let him love you. Experience the love of God for the first time. These words are read out earlier from Psalm 62. A great, great way to kind of draw what I'm saying to a close, but I want us to actually have the opportunity to respond. Psalm 62. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. You know, if we don't have God, what hope do we have? But we are people of hope like nobody else because we should be eternal optimists because we have Jesus. Full of hope in every situation because we have Jesus. Truly he is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation depends on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. And then this, these last words here of Psalm 62, which, uh, verse 7, which kind of go hand in hand, if you like, with what I've been saying from Matthew 11. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him because God is our refuge. That's why we do it. We'll find refuge, we find peace, we find comfort, we find hope. I guarantee, guarantee, absolutely guarantee, and it's not my word, it's God's word, that if we go to God, if we do that this morning, if we say, I don't understand all this stuff, God, I'm anxious, I'm worried, I'm racked with all this stuff, but I'm going to come to you, then we'll meet with him. He'll pour out his presence upon us. And if it's for the very first time, it will change your life. Life will not be the same again because you'd have met the creator of the universe who loves you. The one who takes our burdens from us. Let me read this for you. Come to me all who, are late, all who labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light.
don't know about you, but I'm signing up for that. I want Jesus to carry me. I want Jesus to take me. I want Jesus to walk with me.